Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Keen. Uh, I'm from Ireland. I'm, my background is an ecologist, and I'm recently transitioning into the remote sensing area. Um, this is actually my first remote sensing conference, so it's actually been great to meet all of you and see all the work that you're doing. It's all very impressive, and I'm going to talk about what comes from the remote sensing that I've been doing in the last year. Well, I kind of started out from a very ecological background. My PhD is in ecology. I'm a field ecologist by training, so going out and mapping, uh, surveying uh, plants and animals in the field. But I kind of the, the genesis of this work is from working on a project in Ireland called Farm Zero C. And what we were trying to do is work with uh, dairy. Dairy is a big industry in Ireland. It's one of the biggest uh, agricultural industries in Ireland. Very big exporter, but also then one of the biggest environmental polluters and uh, damages of biodiversity. So this project is trying to you know, demonstrate that dairy can be more sustainable. And what we set out to do was reduce emissions on our, our dairy farm. We took one dairy farm, uh, and the aim was to reduce emissions by 20%, increase biodiversity, uh, which is just the area of you know, natural habitat on the farm, to 10%. So this is starting out at about 6%, uh, and then maintain profitability of the farm. And we actually did this. We achieved that in one year. So we got we did reduce emissions by 20%. This is using technologies that are currently available in the market. Um, in Ireland, we set a target to reduce uh, agri agricultural emissions by 25% by 2030. So we've demonstrated that this is you know kind of feasible on one farm, and now the issue is about scaling it. Um, and it, for the biodiversity target, that's actually a European target. I'll mention this in a second. Is 10% habitat area. Um, so th this was, you know, great to be able to demonstrate this on one farm, but then to really have impact, you have to scale. Uh, so that's kind of where I got interested in remote sensing. And we're working with Carberry, who are they're just a, a cheese producer in Ireland, but they have 1,200 farm suppliers. So if we want to really, you know, have impact at scale, we need to be creating tools that can, you know, monitor emissions at that across the whole supply chain, but also then map biodiversity across the supply chain. What level are they, is the supply chain currently at? Uh, and then how could they go about increasing biodiversity to a 10% target to reach this kind of Green Deal target that I'll mention here. So obviously European Green Deal, a lot of people talked about it this week. Um, one of their key targets is this kind of uh, at least 10% of agricultural area under high diversity landscape features. So what that means for a company like Carberry is that they would want, you know, on average, the farms in their supply chain to have this, you know, be at, at around 10%. Uh, so we, we're, we're trying to create a tool that will be able to uh, image each farm in the supply chain. And, uh, you know, we have a kind of tool to be able to visualize where those 1,200 suppliers are at in terms of each, the, in, each individual farm, uh, what percentage biodiversity that, and is that, at that is, the, is the average across the supply chain 10% or not? That's kind of where we're trying to go with this. But then recently there was um, this big directive that came out uh, from Europe, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. And this is kind of the 800 pound grill in the room from the kind of private side, because now all these companies are going to have to report on their emissions, biodiversity, uh, climate change impacts, um, you know, from 2025 on, I have a timeline in seconds. And there is this, within this, there's so many uh, acronyms within all these different policies, but in, within the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, there's this European Sustainability Reporting Standard. So this is what the companies have to report on within this directive. And one of them is this biodiversity and ecosystems. So, you know, the kind of Green Deal is at the kind of policy level and particularly impacting the common agricultural policy. And then this corporate sustainability reporting directive is really impacting the corporates, the, the farm suppliers, the people who produce milk or whatever uh, uh, agriculture we're talking about. They're going to have to report on their biodiversity ecosystems in their supply chain. Uh, so that's quite, a, when you talk to these companies, they are terrified of what actually this means for them because it's actually quite a difficult task to do this. Um, so who does this apply to in terms of the companies? There's a bit more information on this corporate sustainability reporting directive. KPMG, who are a big accountancy firm, estimate there's 50,000 companies uh, will have to uh, report on climate and biodiversity uh, and other types of um, um, you know, ESG type measures. Um, and you know, there's kind of a few criteria for what, what makes these, uh, you know, what makes company have to report. So uh, all large companies that have meet, meet this lady's work, all large companies that meet, meet at least two of these criteria. So if you've more than 250 employees, that kind of, this one here, more than 250 employees, or if you're a total balance sheet with 20 million euro. So that, there's kind of estimation of just 50,000 companies. And we think there's around three or four, three to 5,000 agri-food companies in Europe that are gonna have to start reporting on, on climate change, uh, biodiversity, et cetera. Uh, 
And the timeline for this, this, so this is only recently published. This is, came out in July this year, this Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. There's some companies that'll have to report in 2024, the ones that already have to report on there's some other scheme, but all these large companies I just mentioned, if you've over 250 employees, a net balance sheet of a certain number, you're gonna to have to start reporting from 2025 on your climate change impacts and your biodiversity and supply chain. And then even the small companies are gonna to have to start reporting in 2026 uh, or 2026, 2027. So this is a massive policy and it's gonna really change how companies have to report uh, their impacts in the EU. Um, and these are, these are all the different um, kind of policy metrics they have to report on. So there's a kind of general requirements, but then there's the ES, ESG, and we're particularly interested in this biodiversity ecosystem uh, for this talk. Uh, so I'm trying to create a tool that will help companies report uh, uh, reporting under this, this metric here. So when they say report, what do you actually have to measure? So if a company is deemed to cause land use change somehow, which most agricultural companies, uh, every few companies obviously are involved in somehow, they're going to have to report on some of these different measures here. So conversion of, over time of land cover, changes in spatial configuration, uh, changes in intensity management as well. So it's some kind of land use type uh, uh, reporting metrics suggested there as well. And then the change of the ecosystem structural connectivity. So this is, you know, this is where the remote sensing really comes in. Uh, th these are metrics that remote sensing will provide to these companies. Uh, so there's a massive... Uh, private sector now interest in these type of uh, uh, you know um, tools uh, and so I, I mentioned KPMG estimated that there was 50,000 companies these there's big accountancy firms KPMG Deloitte EY etc Accenture they're all hiring massively in the space particularly management consultants but also people who are kind of have your type of skills to develop models and ways to uh, uh, you know monitor these metrics for companies because now companies have to report this so what, what resources are out there? What free resources are out there? So this is just a farm that we work with intensely, that one farm that we reduced the emissions by 20% and got the biodiversity 10%. This is our kind of demonstrator farm is what we call it. And this is a habitat map that I produced by kind of, you know, walking around the farm and actually, you know, doing a really detailed habitat map. Uh, and then I'm just going to compare this to some kind of free resources that are out there. So this is the com compare high resolution layers. Hopefully this comes up. So this is the kind of, I think it's the dominant leaf type uh, High resolution layer at the 10 meter resolution level so it does pick up some of the you know big woodland pieces here on the side but it does miss a lot of the you know this kind of uh, more woody areas up here this is sorry, in red here that's conifer uh, light green is um uh, semi-natural woodland uh, deciduous woodland um so this high resolution layer is, is useful for picking up some of the bigger woodland patches but not all the smaller bits we add in grassland, but it doesn't really distinguish between semi-natural grassland, which is, you know, we count as biodiversity and pasture, which we wouldn't count as biodiversity. And then there's the small, uh, I think it's a small woody features, or uh, I'm not sure what kind of remember the name of this layer, but this does capture more of the uh, parts of the, the habitats in the farm. So it does capture these kind of bits down here at the bottom uh, of the farm, but it's, again, still misses out on a lot of the hedgerows and uh, smaller linear features on the farms that are actually make up about 50% of uh, habitats on farms. So if we're going to be measuring this for companies and they have to, they, they want to really get an accurate measurement of the you know, biodiversity and supply chain. They don't want to be using resolution that, well, it's, it's great that it's free, but the resolution means that they're likely going to get a much lower percentage biodiversity in the supply chain. So they want you know, more accurate measurements than I think that can be provided by Copernicus high resolution layers. This is produced by Science-Based Targets for Nature. This is kind of a voluntary initiative that's reporting initiative that's like the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, but it's not mandatory, it's, it's voluntary. And this is a natural land la natural lands map produced by the World Resources uh, Institute, uh, who gave a talk this morning. Uh, and this is the same area. So this is the same area, I'm just flicking back and forth, same area, but they don't really capture the biodiversity there. So. I think again the resolution here is not good enough, and then the you know the the what 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 kind of categories are actually classifying. Uh, you, I think we, you want a bit more detail to really get you know at biodiversity. Uh, so I don't think that's useful. And then we go to more on the kind of you know uh, paid end. This is this is an image from Airbus from Applied these image. So it's, this is 0 0.5 meter resolution, and they have their own kind of land cover map that they've produced. I want to highlight just this area here. So this is kind of an area of semi-natural grassland, really, and there's a bit of scrub here. Uh, but when and they, in the, but in the land cover map, it's just kind of grassland. So they're 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 not really trying to. They're focused on kind of vegetation as just grassland or or forest, and then they're really kind of mapping those kind of buildings and that kind of thing. 
but they're not really mapping trying to map biodiversity. So even this very high resolution land cover map from that you could purchase from play, uh, Airbus wouldn't work in this use case. Um, so, well, this is another resource that's out there. So this is just, but this is just local to Ireland. So uh, this uh, was published back in spring in Ireland, national land, the national land cover map. And it's really good. So this is the kind of quality that we need, I think, to be able to measure biodiversity and supply chains. You have, you know, these, you know, uh, hedgerows here. Uh, you have the, air, the parcel of semi-natural grassland, uh, and you, it's a scrub up here on top. And then you're identifying like the different type, types of forests. So, you know, you're really getting from just kind of broad vegetation land and cover or, cl or classification down to much more detailed kind of habitats, really. So that's the kind of level that we need to get to, I think, if we were to do this uh, supply chain mapping, particularly in a, in a country like Ireland, where you have lots of these patches of uh, hedgerows in between fields and things like that. Like Gilberto was talking this morning about, you know, it's kind of global, global maps versus local maps. I think in this case, we need more kind of regional or local maps that are very specific to the region of interest and take in kind of uh, information to that region and use that to inform what kind of classification is going on, what kind of habitats are there, what kind of habitats you're looking for. Um, I think that's actually crucial. Um, but this map was produced using, um, it was, well, the reference year is 2018, so it's already out of date. Uh, and it was produced using aerial imagery, so they flew a plane across the country, imaged the whole country, uh, and then used Sentinel-2 imagery as well, and a, and a DSM. Um, and it's great, but they also used uh, eCognition, uh, which is, you know, a, a private software, so it's not open source, you, can, you can't really replicate this. Um, um, and they, they, they don't make the, didn't, make the, didn't make the training data open or anything. So, uh, this is this is very closed and it's very difficult for somebody else to go and uh, kind of recreate this type of uh, work. Uh, and the team who actually made this, it, 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 so this this took four, six years to create and cost four million euro. Uh, so it's and the team who, who, who created this is actually disbanded now in Ireland. So I'm not sure if this is going to be repeated in Ireland. It'd be great if it was. In you know, it, it should be repeated now, given the reference year 2018, uh, to see any change. Um, well, yeah, it doesn't look like there will be uh, in the next year or two anyway, any sign of this being repeated. So my aim was to try and take the kind of methodology that I used to try and create a more a satellite-based version uh, habitat mapping system and then make the code open so that other people could build on top of that. So I used a similar kind of, tech, uh, kind of uh, workflow that they use. So it's an object-based image analysis I'll talk about in, in a second. Um, so I want to take... Uh, Aerial image and then satellite image, and this is very high resolution imagery. I will go back. I'll talk about that in a second again. I'm going to take a kind of area of area of interest, which is the farm, create a habitat map, and then further than that, I just want I don't want to just create a land cover map or a habitat map. I also want to create a, a habitat condition map. So I want to use some kind of ecological, uh, you know, theory, and then classify how or measure how uh, you know what the quality of the habitat is. So we're not just looking at extent or area we're looking also at quality um, so that's kind of what i set out to do with this piece of work <clears throat> the resolution choice so you have 10 meters this is the same image on, on this farm that we're talking about uh sentinel spot at six meter spot two meter sharpened and this applied to 50 centimeters these linear habitats and farms make up about 50 percent of the uh, habitats and farms so if you're not measuring these uh, habitats, you're, you're really going to miss most of the biodiversity, well, a lot of the biodiversity on these farms. Um, so I don't think it is suitable to just go for the you know, open source. It's great if we could, but I don't think it is to do this biodiversity supply chain mapping. I don't think we can use the central to imagery. Maybe, maybe, you, you probably know better than me, but in my uh, experience, it's been using this very high resolution imagery that's produced the best results. Um, so I, I've used this Pleiades 50 centimeter resolution imagery, particularly to get these linear habitats. Um, otherwise you miss most of the habitat uh, biodiversity on, on the farms. What counts as biodiversity? So the way the European Commission uh, specified it in their in the Green Deal, the biodiversity strategy 2030 uh, policy was 10% agricultural area under high diversity landscape features. So they don't really use the term biodiversity. They talk about high diversity landscape features, which is, Fair, actually. I think it's a good way of describing what we're trying to get at. Um, so I'm just, you know, different land covers here, what counts as biodiversity, you know, all these very, you know, artificial or man-made uh, habitats, we don't count as biodiversity. 
Uh, and then we get into the land covers that I would count as biodiversity in an Irish context. So conifer woodland, there's no native conifer forests in Ireland. So any conifer forest that you find in Ireland is a plantation forest. So it wouldn't count in Ireland as biodiversity, but it could in other countries. So, you know, this is again why we need these more can be context specific uh, kind of maps and kind of land cover classifications. And then I count these four different kind of uh, three other different woody features. So deciduous woodland, scrub and hedgerow then semi-natural grassland as biodiversity. I also classify shadow because of the very high resolution imagery. Maybe have some suggestions on how to deal with shadow. I'm not very good at dealing with it. I just classify it at the moment. Um, and then it's object-based image analysis. Uh, so I just, again, this is a, just an example of uh, segmenting a, the same image using different kind of parameters. There's lots of different algorithms out there. This is the algorithm that I've settled on uh, because it produced the best segmentation. Uh, I, I found that it did. But again, you might have better recommendations and I'd like, like to hear them. Um, so again, just, I, I kind of picked this, these parameters, uh, which kind of segment out most of the fields, but also give me enough kind of uh, smaller segments in other parts of the uh, land. So it really segment at, at the pasture as well, but then gives me enough segments in other parts to you know, classify, is this hedgerow or scrub or same natural grassland? Um, so that's, that, that's why I settled on there. And then the data set, so this is the size of the data set. So, you know, it's only 5,000 ob labeled objects. It's not a balanced data set yet. Mostly it's pasture. And I'm, you know, still working on building this out. I'm going to get this up to 10,000 and kind of balance this out more. And then these are where the images come from. So uh, the pink there, or the, the light blue is where the training images are. Uh, and the supply chain I'm working with down, is down to this part of uh, Ireland. Uh, so I've taken most of my training images from here. Each image is 25 kilometers squared. And I've been kind of testing the transfer onto these other uh, pink images. Again, not a small, not a big data set, but it's very high resolution imagery. Uh, but again, I will be expanding this out more as I continue on uh, developing this out. So the workflow summary, uh, it's a 12 stage process, object-based image analysis and have a random, flyer, random forest classifier. There's multi-sensor fusion going on. So I use this Pleiades imagery, 0.5 meter resolution, and I get it for June, July uh, of the latest year I can get. And then I have central imagery and I get create cloudless composites for each season within the same year uh, to get some kind of spatial, uh, kind of seasonal variation. Uh, and then I have central one radar as well. I get the VV and VH composites for each season too. Uh, and I have some geometric data. So again, I can measure, take out the my seg segmented. I measure some of the variables that I, uh, from the segments. And then I have uh, these, that's an unbelievable and of 20% held out for testing. Just to go into a bit more detail, because I, I want to really go through this in detail so that if you have any feedback, you can uh, tell me how to improve this process. So I take the RGB, sharpen it, uh, normalize it, and I clip the, you know, just the top 1% of the bands, uh, just to kind of bring the, the, the distributions in a bit so I don't get, um, you know, kind of outlier uh, uh, pixels. And then I also create this HSV, so different color, uh, color, color representation. Just I, I tried to add this into the model to see if that would help a lot or a bit. Um, and then I create ten, eight different uh, indices. I do some GLCM, so gray level core occurrence matrices, and I pick out two just because they're so computationally expensive to create. These are the ones I found were best for my use case. And then I also create local binary patterns because they're much faster. Um, to, to create, and I have uh, five of those. So overall, just from this uh, RGB NIR image, I have 24 bands. So it's kind of like, uh, um, uh, you know, they're all the derivative data you can get from, you can get, you can create a lot more, but these are the ones I'm using, 24 derivative bands from that one uh, play this image. And then I use the, send, uh, the OpenEO API, which I found actually very good. Uh, I, I, I've, once I found it got it to work, it was like magic that I could just download the central images do all the, uh, you know, um, the seasonal mosaicing and uh, you know, removing clouds. Uh, and then I, you know, I add them into my tiles. So seasonal comp composites for a Sentinel 2 and Sentinel 1. Uh, so I then have 24 bands from the Sentinel uh, series as well. And then I merge them all, normalize, uh, do some normalization. So everything's between zero and one. Uh, and then I then I carry out the segmentation. So I showed that earlier. So I create uh, carry out segmentation based on the kind of merge bands. 
Um, and then I polygonize. So each of these, this is now a polygonized version of uh, the segments, not a raster anymore. Now it's polygons. And I extract four, four different uh, um, bands from that uh, area perimeter shape index and the convex hull area, which is kind of a measure of how, uh, if it's, yeah, well, I won't explain that. Um, and then what I do is, you know, take these central bands, the Pleiades bands, and I, within each object, I take the min, max, variance, skewness, ptosis of each of those 24 bands, resulting, so that's just, it's, it's 48 bands by five to give me 240 bands total. So this is a lot of, again, it's very high dimensional uh, data. Uh, and then I added my four geometry bands to give me 244 total. And I do some kind of dimensionality reduction. Uh, this is kind of the final kind of classifier. Uh, and I test out different, you know, parameters here using some kind of, um, uh, you know, exploration of the parameter space. Um, and then this, finally, this is the kind of accuracy assessment. So I've gone through that detailed uh, breakdown of the, of the process because the accuracy assessment here is I'm giving the accuracy at each additional in, bit of information into the, into the model, uh, and I'm reporting balance and F1 scores. So this is uh, RGB, and then I add in HSV color representation, and then I add in the indices. So this is the sum of all the, like this final uh, 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 column here would be the sum of be the total process that I went through. And each other column is kind of one step back, and we're seeing where the accuracy comes from. So starting out with the RGB, you have a kind of actually around 75%, and then you kind of slowly increase up to, a, I'm getting around 85, 86% on this final central one, uh, when I add in the central one imagery. Uh, and actually selecting the K, like the kind of data reduction method didn't really give me any more uh, uh, data, uh, uh, classification actually. Uh, where's, where the, where's the classification actually coming from? There's a big jump here with the indices, so they obviously add a lot, a lot of value. Uh, the geometry doesn't really seem to that much. And then the Sentinel-2 imagery actually helps a lot. So that's a seasonal variation. The Sentinel-2 variation helps a lot. And then again, even adding in the Sentinel-1 helps even more. So I was, you know, this was actually a, a big help using that Sentinel imagery. Um, so that's, 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 you know, a reasonable accuracy assessment uh, result, 85. But, you know, if we want to be measuring 10% habitat in these farms. You know, is a farm at 10% or not? We want to be trying to get at whether a farm is at 6%, 7%, 8%. We want to be able to distinguish between those very, you know, high resolution uh, or very small, small percentage differences. An 88 or 86% classification accuracy model is not going to do that really. So we need to get, you know, we need to be, what Gilberto had this morning about 95% accuracy, that, that's the level we need to get to. So this is not there yet, uh, but it's maybe a step along that road. Um, this is just to show you kind of what, what it looks like. Uh, so these are three different regions in Ireland. I haven't actually put a legend on this, but uh, light blue here is semi-natural grassland, orange is scrub, and then red is conifer, and green is semi-natural. This light green here is semi-natural grassland, uh, semi-natural uh, forest. Uh, so it's doing a reasonable job. Yellow here is arable. So this is a very high intensity agriculture region, much lower intensity here. Uh, and the dark green here is, is pasture. So it's picking out, you know, this is the same natural grass and it's picking out well on this farm um, and the scrub uh, and distinguishing out the same natural uh, woodland here from the conifer woodland over here, you know, so it's doing a reasonable job, but again, will this be, can this be used yet? I don't think it's, it's really there, um, but it's again, step along direction. But user and producer actually for different land cover types. I would be like, I, I would have been happy with a, you know, my aim was to get a minimum 80% producer actually across the, 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 the land cover types. And it's this, this hedge, the semi-natural grassland and the scrub that are the tricky ones. They get confused a lot. These are, these are kind of categories of, again, what is, what is when you're trying to describe nature, where this is ab they're all abstractions to some extent, and the semi-natural grass and scrub, and scrub, they bleed into each other a lot. And then scrub also bleeds into semi-natural uh, woodland and bleeds into hedgerow. So there's, that's where the, the it's having difficulty classifying the different types of biodiversity that's in these farms. It's pretty good at classifying what's not biodiversity. So all these other uh, uh, features. So maybe we'd be able to get to a percentage habitat on these farms and not be so good at identifying what that habitat is composed of. But maybe we can actually measure percentages more so than what the biodiversity is. Uh, this is just 
producer versus user actually, and then the kind of number of points. So it doesn't seem that adding in more points is going to maybe like give me much more. I'm going to do that, but uh, there's not a nice, very strong relationship here between number of points. It is the kind of just that these are difficult to uh, distinguish uh, land covers. So model transfer. So this is so that, those results I showed were from uh, test data that was within the images that I created that I got the training data from. So it's the transfer is to uh, trying it on uh, the model on images where I didn't have any training data. And I don't have good graphs here because this is still very fresh off the press. I was trying to actually get a graph ready for this presentation yesterday, but I didn't get it. But it's around 7%. So it drops 15 percentage points once I'm not using uh, an image where I have training data from. Um, so it's not great. Uh, we, this is, you know, it, that, we can't use this uh, if it's going to be, you know, dropping 10%. So we need to really increase the accuracy here. Um, what I'm trying to do about that, well, I'm going to increase the data set of points, uh, balance out the classes. A DSM would be very useful because, uh, you know, that distinguishing between scrub and say natural grassland, that height vegetation, that height data would be very useful. But it's very expensive. You can buy this from you know, providers in Ireland and stuff, but it's very expensive to get. And then the ones that you can get at kind of European scale are like 30 meters or something, which don't really match up with the resolution that I'm trying to map this biodiversity at. And suggestions are very welcome. <clears throat> um, uh, so in terms of habitat condition, um, once you have this habitat map, we can create, a, you know, uh, look at, use some ecological principles to turn it into a condition map. So how close are the habitats together? Uh, what is the connectivity, et cetera? And I'm working on developing an OR Shiny app to do this. Uh, this will be completely open source. And I'm using SF, STARS, and then this conifer, which is looking at the importance of habitat patches, and then this morphological spatial pattern analysis. And it will just have a kind of one to 10 score. Uh, I'm not going to run through this because I'm actually running out of time. But if you want to come and talk to me about this, uh, I'm you know I'm happy to work with people on developing this out a bit more. But this is kind of just a, a scoring uh, example for woody features. So this is conifer, scrub, and semi natural forest. And we, I've developed a, a scoring uh, kind of classification for what counts as a good quality forest. And again, but this is in an Irish context. These would have to be developed out for each kind of landscape that you're working with. So for connectivity, you'd be using this kind of for a command line application for more. And then for the degree of core habitat, which is more important when I'm using this morphological spa spatial pattern analysis. So the core habitat here is important. And we're also looking at do, do habitats link other habitats together. So this kind of condition is very important when we're actually, and this is re required to be reported in the CSRD as well. And you can produce this condition map and you get different scores for habitats, et cetera. Uh, in conclusion, kind of summary, scaling this to whole supply chain. We, you need to know where the farms are. Uh, the, uh, there's a land parcel identification system across the whole of Europe where you can, you know, know what, you know, you can group farms together, but it's personal information for the farms. Farmers, but you can request it to be anonymized. And in Ireland, I could get it for the whole Cork region. And then they can work with the Agri Food Corporate to say, you have 1,200 suppliers. They're in this general area. Let's pick out 1,200 anonymized farm, farm areas in this region, map those, and we can then report on your biodiversity. So that is the way you'd go about trying to measure biodiversity in the supply chain, not just at the whole landscape. Um, the cost of the imagery is seven euro per kilometer squared. So it would cost roughly 5,000 euro to do the whole supply chain. So maybe maybe the corpus will go for this, but this is you know this is another year or two in, to see if this will actually be uptake. Uh, summary: I'm probably out of time, so I'll just uh, call there questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shen. Any questions? Shin, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. I think I mentioned it yesterday to you already um, that a semantic classification of the satellite imagery might add some uh, value to your classifier. So have a look at uh, the satellite uh, automatic mapper from the University of Salzburg that um, might help you actually. I'll send you an email. Yeah, do follow up with me. I'll That'd be great. If anybody else has any suggestions, please do come up to me afterwards and let me know. Again, I am you know, relatively new to this. but Maybe yeah. to add on this, if you go back to your slide where you show the, um, the uh, single bands, basically, with the reflectance values, 
a couple of slides, like a lot of slides, slides back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there, there you can actually see you um, basically, you crunch a little bit the histogram. Yeah. Well, what would help there is actually with uh, this uh, semantic layer in between is that you're actually looking at the uh, single, uh, basically the single reflectance values of the pixel and don't need to basically crunch the histogram together. So uh, that might be able to help you in classifying more than, and it also works, it, it works on Sentinel imagery, but also it works on uh, Pleiad data. Okay, thanks for that. Any other question, comments? Okay, if none, then we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Shen.